for Good evening. I'd like to call a school board meeting for Monday, April 25th, 2016 to order, please. Roll call. Vandy Creek here. Halloran here. Anderson here. Tronson here. Van Landen here. Williams here. We have a quorum. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Before we keep move any further, we got to uh, move on. Uh, we have a couple of uh, things that we have to take care of this evening. First of all is the swearing in of new board members that we have uh, at our election uh, April 5th. And uh, the winners of the election, Mr. Paul Tronson and um, Barb Helleron. Mr. Uh, Dr. Haynes, would you like to do the honors? Okay. You have the, uh, the listing, John. We're swearing in. They each have those. We have. Okay. At this point, I'd like to ask both of you to rise. And if, if you will, can you repeat the oath together in unison? Oh, really? Yes. Okay. Sure. That should be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> harmony, too. Would be good. If Just you like want to do it, trick or something. If you want to do it in harmony, <laughs> that would be fine. But this is not a race, <laughs> right? Paul, <laughs> Paul, do you sing? Because I don't. <laughs> oh, this no, is not a race. Say. So, I, Paul Tronson. Having been, elected, having been elected or appointed, appointed, appointed to the office of the trauma office. school board swear that I will support, support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the state of Wisconsin and I will faithfully and impartially discharge the duties of said office to the best of my ability to help you God. Congratulations, you're officially sworn in. Sign those and pass it down, please. I'll have that to Paul's daughter in just a moment here. <laughs> okay. There you go. Thank you. Okay. An announcement of uh, our, uh, we need a motion to adopt the agenda. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Uh, announcement of executive session. Accordance with Wisconsin Statute 19.851C, an executive session will be held at the end of the meeting for the purpose of considering employment, promotion, compensation, or performance evaluation data of any public employee over which the governmental body has jurisdiction or exercises responsibility. In accordance with Wisconsin Statute 19.851B, an executive session will be held at the end of the meeting for the purpose of considering Dismissal, demotion, licensing, or discipline of any public employee or person licensed by a board or commission or the investigation of charges against such person or considering the grant of de or denial of tenure for a university, you know, university faculty member and taking a formal action of any such matter, provided that the faculty member or other public employee or person licensed is given actual notice of any evidentiary hearing which may be held prior to final action being taken of any meeting at which final action may be taken. The notice shall contain a statement that the person has the right to demand that the evidentiary hearing or meeting be held in open session. Um, at this time, uh, we're going to election of officers and board appointments, committee responsibilities and assignments. Election of officers, Dr. Haynes. Okay, we're at the time of the year where we're approaching another upcoming school year for board member service, and it's it's typical that we re-elect our officers. So at this point, I will ask if there are any nominations for the office of president. Make a motion that we uh, that uh, we uh, elect uh, um, J. Van Lannan. Okay, we have a motion for J. Van Lannan. Are there any other nominations for president? Are there any other nominations for president? I'm just going to make a statement here real quick. As I am stepping down as president right now, I, I uh, appreciate the board's uh, um, support in all of this, uh, but uh, I'm coming into the final year of my uh, term, and. Um, I just think that it's time for that we make some changes. So I appreciate that, though. 
Okay, we have a nomination on the table for Jay for president. Do we have a second for this nomination? Second. We have a second by Brian. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, the motion carries. And congratulations, Jay, Thank as you. president. I'll, I'll turn the other officers over to you, Jay. Okay, the next would be the vice president. Are there any nominations for the office of vice president? Make a motion that we appoint uh, Brian Vandekree. Are there any other nominations for vice president? Any other nominations? At this time, we'll vote for nomination of Brian as the office of vice president. Do we need a second on that? Yes. Mm -hmm. We have a second. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, next office position is clerk. Are there any nominations for the office of clerk? It's an easy job. I know. I know some people. I'll make a motion that we appoint Barb Hellron as a clerk. <laughs> I'll second. <laughs> Look at they're all laughing. I don't think it's a good one. <laughs> I did that for like nine years. Yes. <laughs> okay, we have a uh, nomination in the second for um, Barb to be clerk. Is there any other nominations? Any other nominations? So at this time, we'll vote for the nomination of Barb Halloran as clerk. All in flavor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Well, she carries. You're good? Thanks, yeah, Barb. Thank okay. <laughs> uh, at this time now, we'll have the uh, nominations for the treasurer. Any nominations for the treasurer? I'll nominate Paul Tronson. We have a second on that? I'll second it. And do we have any other nominations? Any other nominations? Okay. Um, at this time, we'll vote for nomination of treasurer for Paul Tronson. All in favor? All right. Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. And I think that leaves one position left for me. We don't have to vote. No. And Brian would now be the at-large member. Mark. 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 I'm sorry, Mark. Mm -hmm. Okay, next uh, is uh, H2, our board appointments. Um, for graduation this year, we're going to be doing something unique. Um, do you want to go through that, Brian, or Mark? Uh, the Alumni Association has been uh, um, putting together, last year was our, our kickoff, the 50th year anniversary of the school district, and we had the big anniversary party at the Fowlmay Park last August. And uh, one of the things that we approach the senior class with is that um, we want to have all 50 years of graduating class represented at this graduation. So we are having all a representative from the last 50 years walk at graduation. We're going to have them in cap and gowns and everything. And my proposal was to have all of the graduating school board members distribute diplomas this year as well. Barb, I'm sorry, but that's only there's four. Ousted back out? <laughs> <laughs> You're more than welcome that's to fine. come up and walk with she, us and everything. A, but a retired teacher. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, does that count for anything? Yes, but only <laughs> alumni are walking right now. I'm using it, that's so, fine. Um, I'm, I'm proposing that the four of us that have, uh, that are Graduated. Graduates, um, also, I'll be up there as we get graduation this year. You guys okay with that? No, you talk about wearing the gown. So yep. Yes. So it's going to be a very unique graduation. Uh, not a lot. Uh, this has not been done before. It's, it's uh, uh, going to be a, kind of a fun thing, and uh, I think that. Uh, Mr. Nelson is on board with it, and uh, the whole senior class, I believe, as well. So, okay. So, uh, the next graduation would be the eighth grade graduation. That's Tuesday, June seventh, at six thirty. We generally like to have one person be there. I can be there. Okay. I can try to be there as well. So. If you don't mind to. No? no? You're okay with that? So, what are you 
we usually just take we make a motion on this or not or we just no, I, no I think it was all informal. Okay. okay. Uh, next would be our fifth grade graduations. Uh, Valley View is Friday, June third, at one thirty, and Pioneer is Thursday, June second, at six o'clock. I could attend Valley Views. Um, I should be able to attend the 6 p.m. one at Pioneer. Okay. I could also be there, too. At the Pioneer one? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. And then D, uh, the WASB convention, which is our state school board convention, January 18th through the 20th. Mark and I went last year. I don't know if you guys can get off of work for that. It's a... To that right now. I, I, can't maybe, I can give a maybe. Because I would go again. I'm a maybe out there also. I mean, usually what I with with uh, serving on the committee that I did last year for WSB is um, they usually want a two-year commitment, so I might be there anyways for that. But that's yeah. And if you want to be delicate, that's fine. Yeah. Because that'll be there. That's what I'm, we're doing is putting those forward. Yeah. <laughs> And E, the CESA 7 meeting, which is Wednesday, May 11th at 6.30. We should look good that to the new board member, don't we? I, yes, we have in the past. Is <laughs> that initiation or something? <laughs> that one we may have to vote on if it doesn't. Uh, it's great food. It's, yeah, they're really good food. Oh, they do? Okay, I'm in then. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get you the information on that. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, now on the I, establish board meeting and time and place. Uh, one is our annual board meeting, which this year is July 25th at 6 p.m. at district office. Are we, do we establish it for next year? We don't establish it until then, right? That's correct. Okay. Yeah. And there's no discussion about that. That's, that's, that's already set in stone, stone, right? right. Okay. Um, for our Regular monthly board meetings, we have two options um, to discuss. First option would be moving our meetings to the second Monday of the month rather than the fourth Sunday of the month because of the fact that we've always had to move our thing or November and their December meetings because of Thanksgiving and Christmas. Um, by and spring break, yes. If we go to the second Monday of the month, the only ones that we would have to move would be the October 24th one, that's to certify the levy, and then our annual meeting this year. Now our annual meeting this year, we could set it up so next year it could yes. be the second Tuesday. Yeah, because we had already determined this in last year's annual meeting, we can't change this date but we can change it for 2017. Okay, and that's option B, I'm sorry. But option A would be leaving it as a fourth Sunday. Monday. Fourth Monday. And then we would have um, the first, our next meeting, which would be May 9th, um, would have to be changed. And then the Christmas and the spring break would also be changed. Well, I got a question. I guess uh, the administrators and everything does that. Does it screw you guys up as far as your reports and stuff that you do to us, or any way, shape, or form? The one thing that I consider when I hear that is open enrollment projections have to be approved by February first, and the Virginia Board of Education has approved all the projections an estimate either way we just have to be conservative in our estimate so I, I don't think that's a major issue I think approving it by the day we do we're guessing at that point so much anyway a couple weeks isn't going to matter okay. anybody else either, either way works for me yeah. either way for me as well and this would start after the annual meeting anyway right or, or no, it would be starting, starting May, May. May. Yeah. Oh, okay the meetings that we're approving tonight start start May, May 9th. May through April next year. Gotcha. And you have to remember that 
traditionally we've done two meetings a month. So mm -hmm. we've, uh, we do have that ability open if we do need to have a second meeting. And then that would push it to the fourth of Monday of the week. Okay, either way. I mean, when we discussed this, uh, Jay and myself and Brian, I mean, we threw it out there as an option because we were switching so many meetings. It's like, well, what happens if we go to the first meeting, first Monday of the month as well? And uh, it, it doesn't, we've only got to change basically two in this year, but next year potentially could be one. Maybe. There's a couple of them. There's about three of them next year, but. The option B is more consistent for the public to remember and for us. If it really if there's no, I mean, to me, that's the advantage. The other choice you have is we just have to bump around the other ones with option A. I think option B keeps it more consistent throughout the year, and it's a little easier for the public to remember and for for you maybe in terms of planning. But it's really whatever your desire is. And I don't know why I remember why we chose the fourth. It's a sec It's supposed to be the second, the fourth. You know, so yeah. either. I mean, that's what we used to have a few years ago. And then we went to one meeting a month instead. Yeah. So they're a little bit longer meetings now, but you yeah, don't have that one day. Right. You guys all okay that's with fine. that? Yeah, that's I'm fine. okay. With Do we have to vote on that. Oh, yeah, on the option to, B. We have to make yeah. motion on I'll make a motion that we go with option B. First Monday or second, second. Monday of every month. Second. Second. <laughs> Any discussion? Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Can you make a motion, even though the annual meeting has been determined, it still has to yes. make a motion that everybody understands it's on this day? This is meaning we have to do the annual meeting. Make just understand it's on this day. A second a motion, just verifying. Yes. I'll okay. make a motion that we have the annual meeting on July 25th, 2016, at 6 o'clock here. I'll second it. Okay, um, we have a motion in the second. Um, no discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, Jay, citizens and our delegation. Um, is there anybody here that wants to speak to anything that is not on tonight's agenda? Not on tonight's agenda. Nothing? Okay, uh, we'll go J2 student presentation, Parkview Middle Schools. Tonight, our peer mentor group is going to be sharing um, some of the amazing things that they have been doing in the classrooms and the hallways at Parkview Middle School. Um, this peer mentor group started with an Allies in Autism grant that um, was awarded to our special ed team last year, was the first year of the three-year process, and they work with the um, autism consultant Elizabeth Langtu. Um, she visits them at school, and they also um, meet her at conferences throughout the year as well. Um, as I said, this is year two, and the peer mentor program is one of the amazing results of the Allies in Autism grant. Um, positive, positive results. Um, these young people behind me are transforming our classrooms and our hallways and our cafeteria at Parkview Middle School each and every day with the relationships that they are building with one another as well as with the special ed staff. Um, we have three members of our special ed staff here in the front row, Renee Wills, Chrissy Kumhala, and Brittany Sheehy. And Vanessa Tallis um, is going to be um, speaking and introducing each of our students. Um, she has put a lot of um, blood, sweat, and tears into this program and is very proud of what it is becoming as are Mr. Carter and I and all of the teachers at Parkview. So they will introduce themselves and tell all of the great things that they're doing at Parkview. As my heart is beating. <laughs> um, so as Mrs. Hutzak said, we are the Peer Mentor Club. Um, each person is going to kind of share about our background, how we got started. Um, it all started actually with 
Vincent last year, and the ladies will tell you a little bit about that. Um, but something cool that Vincent did this year was that he participated in forensics. So my classroom kind of has two doors, and Mr. Melberg, who runs our forensics, um, has listened to Vincent. He's very into TV stations right now, news stations, and he has this awesome broadcaster voice. And so he said, hey, how about we try front six with him this year? So we were like, okay, let's try it. He, um, this is Sarah Hersher, who is our speech pathologist, along with his parents, Bobby and Mark, and I worked together, and Vincent participated in forensics, knocking it out of the park, earning blue ribbons um, in his different categories. So he's actually going to introduce us and tell you a little snippet that was in one of his broadcasts. So come on up, Vincent. Good evening. My name is Vincent Perrin, and I attend Parkview Middle School. I would like to talk a little bit about a mentor or mentee program that special education teacher Vanessa Tellez has implemented at Parkview. Mrs. Tellez said that the program has been an incredible success in the first official year. There are 10 mentee students and 27 mentor students who work together in classes daily and come together once a month after school for fun activities. Mrs. Seller says that the students really enjoy working together and have developed some really neat relationships. Even teachers are reporting what a difference the peer mentor program is making in the classrooms. It seems as though peer mentor clubs are the way of the future and are a great way to make some positive changes to make sure everyone is included in classrooms. I know I like it! <laughs> How do we get in? We have to fill out an application. We have to get three staff member signatures for recommendations. We have to um, get a parent, a parent signature and we have to answer leadership questions. Feed us pizza and we will come. <laughs> Training is led by Ms. Dallas and Ms. Graves. Some of the things we talked about is, what is autism? What are the common traits of people on the spectrum? How to help support students in the classroom? And we had a pizza party with our mentees. Our lunch and learn meetings, we meet once a month with special ed teachers and we talk about what and we talk about things that are going well and the things we are stuck on. Where to now? Emily, Abby, Kenzie, Mrs. Talis, and I, Dennis Lutza, are headed to Appleton on May 5th to receive the challenge award that includes two thousand dollars grant for our program. Um, so just a little bit behind that, back in, was it November, um, Dr. Haynes had forwarded Chris um, an email about a grants opportunity uh, for this challenge award, and it's for innovative programs that are helping reach students inside the classroom, outside of the classroom, um, up and coming, kind of one, two years old, so we decided to apply, and we got the call in February that we were one of, I want to say seven, five districts, seven districts, something about there, that won a $2,000 grant. So we get to go down next week. Dr. Haynes is accompanying us too. So it'll be a lot of fun and we have, yeah, really just will open up a lot of opportunities for our program. 
Our after school gatherings are a chance to get together once a month outside of the classroom and have fun. So one of our first meetings we did board games and then in December we had fun and we made gingerbread houses with our mentees. We also played minute to minute games. We also planted um, like flowers and um, plants into um, a little pot and we drew on it with Sharpie like quotes and nice things about um, like how peer mentors have changed our life. And we did open gyms with a bunch of different fun activities and we had ice cream party after that to celebrate Autism Awareness Month. Okay, so last year in um, second hour science with Mr. Herzog, we had Vincent in our class, and last year it was um, throwing, screaming, and like this year when you see Vincent in our classrooms, you see that he's had like a big change, and it's like amazing to see him every day and work with him because you've seen how much he's grown from last year to this year. Okay, so these are just like pictures of what we do after school most of our after school activities. So why have you guys joined? What what do you get out of this? Um, friendships. Friendships. Yeah. You really create a really good bond with all the mentees and it just makes you happy to know that you're helping someone. And it's a fun way to interact with <laughs> other people. <laughs> this also teaches other kids that like aren't in this group how they can interact with other kids with autism. And as Ms. Talis said, from us going on to the whole school, we created a big wave, which means that like we started off, and now as you look around the school, you can see that so many people are helping Vincent and other our mentees that aren't even in the program. Yeah, like last year, people who wouldn't even want to talk to Vincent now want to be part of this program, and they want to help out not just Vincent, but other people on the spectrum. Um, um, I think that the Amendment program is a great program because it um, teaches us some really great skills that we can use in our community as well as in our school. We also technically aren't like mentors. Like um, in social studies, uh, fourth hour, me and Abby are in um, that class together and we have um, two mentees and their names are Paige and Seth and they are wonderful and like there's this um, kid and he helps out with us and he didn't really, he he did get offered to be a peer mentor but he really didn't want to be that because he wanted, he didn't really want the name peer mentor but we always tell the kids that we're not really their peer mentors, we're like their friends and it's, you can see the huge change. Which was like interesting to me and Jalen because when he like turned it down and he told um, Jalen and I, and he was like, "Well, I don't want to do that because I know that the kids are going to label me as a peer mentor." And some of our kids on the spectrum, they think, "Oh, well, since you're a peer mentor, you're just here to boss me around." Like that's not the point that we're trying to get to. We're trying to get to the point where like we want to be your friend and like we want to be there to support you and help you learn in the classroom. So that's why me and Jalen were very interested when he turned it down and when he said something. Like so we thought that that was very big. And something else really cool is that our program is getting, it's kind of being known in our area. We actually had a teacher from Brilliant come and shadow um, these amazing students right here. We have, at our last autism meeting, um, Depeer came and approached me and asked if they could possibly come in and shadow us for the day as well. So um, Elizabeth has been kind of bragging about us and getting our names out there. So we have other districts that want to see the really cool stuff that we are doing at Parkview, and they want to implement it. In fact, Brilliant just started their program two weeks ago after they came and shadowed us. Just the kids. <laughs>
the note that I'd like to add is last year when um, Vincent and a couple other students were new to Parkview, um, and Mr. Carter and I were not familiar with them. Um, a few of these young ladies assisted us. Like, we went into their science classroom and we asked for their help because they had been going to school with Vincent for so many years. They were able to help us learn how to work with Vincent better and what works with them and what doesn't. So they've helped us more than they realize since they've started this program. And it's interesting to go back and look at like our yearbook photos. Like I didn't notice until last year that actually Vincent was in my kindergarten class. <laughs> and like most of us, we had our mentees in like our classes in third, fourth, all the way back to kindergarten, which is actually pretty amazing. So we've been friends with them since when we were really young. So that's it. Anybody have any questions? I just have a statement to make. You know, I have a niece, and when she was in high school, she helped students that um, had different types of problems in learning. And then when she went to college, she didn't know what she wanted to do, and she decided to be a teacher. And then from being a teacher, she became a special needs teacher. And now she's a teacher in Minneapolis, and she has a full class of children with autism. So I wonder how many of you will go that way. I want to. I know that. Well, you're amazing. Good job. Good That's job. amazing. Great program. I also just want to give a shout out to Mrs. Tallis and to Mrs. Lamper and the many people in our district. Plates are full and to all the teachers that are here that contributed to the success. You said you made a little wave. From what I've been hearing all year, you've created a big wave at Parkview. In fact, now we're talking about what can we do to launch this at the high school level with some other initiatives. But I want to say thank you. Plates are full and there's a lot to do in education. It takes special initiative and drive for somebody to fill out a grant. If everyone, anyone's ever submitted a grant, that's a lot of work burning the candle probably late at night to submit and you're not sure what will happen. And we had a number of people go forward to write grants and to secure the money and funding to allow this to even happen. So students, you did a great job tonight. And thank you, staff, for all the initiative that you're taking. It's awesome. Keep it going. I actually have a quick, uh, I don't know if it's a question or a comment, but it might be both. Um, is, there, is there a list of these type of things somewhere? Or like these type of programs that we have in Shwabana? I mean, I, I said it last time, you know, the more I come here, the more I'm like, I, I didn't even know about this stuff. I mean, this is just unbelievably awesome things that we do here. And I, I go, if I'm gonna look for recruiting people for the open enrollment, that's what I'm here for is uh, I mean to say hey go check out the website click on this link and you're gonna see these programs that other school districts don't offer so if we had something on the website that would highlight stuff like this and other things I hear about every single time I come here I just I just think it would be a, highlight or unique programs or something. something that would separate you know something that shows how different we are yeah you know we highlight things like that James and the um, district newsletter and mm -hmm. things like that, but to actually have a list on the website, that's something we can talk about as far as a unique category. And why not? It's a good suggestion. It was interesting, um, over the weekend we were doing a rummage sale, we were talking about that earlier, and I had a, a parent um, that is a um, open enrollment uh, parent that brings their kids from over on the east side of Green Bay. And I don't know how we got on this topic of the schools. I think I might have asked her kids what grade they were in and if they went to Valley View or where they went. And she told me that she had a special needs um, child at Valley View and what a wonderful experience they had. And she, and she commented how she was really looking forward to moving him to Parkview for middle school. So programs like this, um, you know, just reinforce their decision to come to Ashwaubenon mm -hmm. for schools. So. Good thing. And then I just would follow up. Do you guys ever bring them into like um, younger grades? Like, do you ever bring Our, those kids? The, the, the mentors? The, well, it's pretty new. We yeah. Yet, but um, 
it's amazing though, like kids will come up and pull me aside and say, I have a question about such and such. And then all of a sudden they'll say, what do we do with such and such? And I'll be like, well, we'll mm -hmm. talk to Mrs. Canola. And they are just, it's amazing. Yeah. But I know that we don't see it all. I know they're starting to um, look at schools in elementary schools. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, that's yeah. good. Yeah. We already said that. That's great. Yeah. I know Elizabeth already goes down to the elementary and she listens to us. Nice. Yeah. yeah. I, that's good. Um, the grant that pays for Parkview, um, it's a three-year grant, so next year what we're looking at doing is expanding Elizabeth's time, so she will be working at Valley View School as well a number of hours, and then we're going to have another consultant who works in the same group, um, because Elizabeth unfortunately can't hit all of our schools, but she's going to be working with Cormier School, and hopefully Pioneer, if I can bring the staff on board with that too, so then we'll have something in all of the buildings, and it would be really exciting because some of the Valley View staff really want to start this peer mentoring program, so I know the Parkview staff is excited if it starts at Valley View, then it'll trickle right. up to Parkview, right. and it just, it, it just grows. It's, it's very exciting what they've been able to do with it at Parkview and embrace all of the change. Because it's been a hard process for the Parkview teachers. I mean, when I first presented them with this, they were like, are you kidding? Yeah. <laughs> I can imagine. They were a little worried and apprehensive, but I think I think all of them would say now that they've been through it and this is their second year, they're like, this is the best thing we've ever done with these kids. Mm -hmm. It's pretty exciting. I think that, I don't know, and you're probably already doing that, but the lesson plans, like the things they're doing after school and stuff, I think that's gold. I think uh, you could and publish that. we just kind that. of brainstorm at meetings and say, you know, yes, what should we do now? Yeah. I've been here, I teach sixth grade too, and I had um, just gotten a new seating chart. And I kind of forgot about the peer mentoring thing when I was arranging seats. And all of a sudden, I had two girls come up and say, You know, we're both peer mentors, and we think we've asked if one of us sat next to this kid because we could help. And one of us said, Awesome, how we're amazing. Like, ding, ding, These sixth graders yes. are, you know, taking initiative to, to figure out where they should sit that would be best for, for the students. And the, you know, it was just, it was awesome. And it's not always easy. I mean, they, they come to us to brainstorm because they have tough days with them too, you know, and so it's neat that they want to do that. You know, when it's a new seat, sometimes they like a little break, but no. So. Good. Wow. Okay, um, let's move on to our consent agenda, um, which consists of the minutes of the regular meeting held Monday, March 6th, March 14th. The scheduled checks written March 9th through April 18th. Uh, staffing, the retirement request from Barbara Dolan Wallace from her full time fifth grade position at Pioneer. Resignation of Charlene Lorizern. Oh, I'm killing that name. La Lorizern from her full time language arts position at the high school. Um, the hire of Melissa Kirst to the 1.0 FDE Globe Instructor position at Pioneer. And then we have five other positions. The new hire of Carrie Lohman as a full-time head cook at the Valley View. The hire of Tila Ghos as a noon duty, duty supervisor at Pioneer. The hire of Laura Rowell <coughs> as a part-time 0.29 FDE cashier and food service at Parkview. Uh, the hire of Jeannie Beyer as a noon duty supervisor at Pioneer. The hire of Michelle LeClaire Mueller as a breakfast supervisor at Pioneer. And the hire of Barbara Machi as a noon duty supervisor at Parkview Middle School. And then we also have two co curricular um, contracts submitted also. Do we get a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, let's move on to L, superintendent's report. All right, uh, just a couple of things to highlight. Every four years or so, the district undergoes a, a very uh, extensive food service audit. And I just want to give a shout out to Betsy Fair uh, after uh, reading the summary results of the audit and a ton of work and a lot of reports that have to be timed and, and completed by Betsy, they just had a lot of really good things. They highlighted her organization, the great job she's doing, what 
comes out of the whole audit clearly for us is that she just has a, a knowledge to know the details in terms of balancing the free and reduced lunch counts and abiding by some pretty complicated standards now to meet the new nutri nutrition requirements. So congratulations to Betty. And I, it's, it's one of those things that a lot of people in the, throughout the whole district, obviously they have no idea what really goes into uh, completing an audit like this. Two people come on site, they interview people, but in advance she prepares all kinds of different reports that have to be, they're, they're pretty picky about it. So I just want to give a shout out to Betsy. It was a real nice, a positive compliment to her, and it's always nice for Keith and I to get reports like that that you know a whole lot goes into in, in just addition to the audit. And then you know this last week, we I think it was banquet awareness week or something, we had a number of appreciation banquets I want to give a shout out again to the Golden Apple Award winner. We had Golden Apple as well as a Herb Cole Educator Recognition Banquets. Congratulations again to Chris Scogg, Teachers of Distinction, Francine Cook and Cassie Burns, and the Herb Cole uh, recipient this year was, was Kathy Kowalczak, so congratulations to all of them. We also had seven people retire this year. And that recognition banquet was last week. That's Allison Bagans, Barbara Dolan Wallace, Debbie Friedel, Joan Gilbert, Deb Hawking, Carrie LaRue, Mara Manning, and Angela Salamone. I totaled up all of their years. That's a total of 187 years serving students here in Ashwaubenon. I was meeting with Paul, kind of prepping them for our, our board service earlier today. And one of the things that I always like to share with our new staff when we do the orientation in the summer, I like to you know keep tabs with Jody. What is our average tenure here in Ashwaubenon? And it tends to be right around the 22-year mark, which these individuals, that it's kind of interesting to look at. I think the lowest was 14 years, and then, I don't know, who was it? Uh, Debbie, I think, was over 40 years, 42 years or something like that, which is pretty incredible. So it says a lot about the people and the culture here, and congratulations and thank you for all those years of service. And my last highlight here is, is an extremely uh, fun accomplishment to highlight, and that's the Parkview Destination Imagination Team. They call themselves the Bean Shot, let me see here, Bean, Beans of Jolly. Beans of Jolly, moving on to the global competition. Do you happen to know off the top of your head what that global is? Is that the end of May. End of May? Labor Day weekend, so, or Memorial Day weekend. Memorial Day weekend off to Nashville. So congratulations to the coach and to all the advisors that pulled on that rope. Pretty neat accomplishment. Any other questions for me, comments? Um, I, uh, there was some, some talk, and I know it's this time of year, and I was talking with Mr. Nelson, and uh, I know that um, the Department of Public Instruction has been talking about I'm switching it from uh, the requirement for uh, the schooling that a uh, student needs from 180 days to 1,400 minutes or something like that. Um, have you guys been talking about or discussing about possibly wanting to extend the school day, like maybe adding eight minutes on to the end of the day? Like, like for example, like if a Schwab in high school, like having instead of having them end at 2:40, having them end at like 2:48. <laughs> have you guys been discussing that at previous meetings by chance? Well, Patrick, we have an agenda item coming up that has to do with um, teacher learning or staff development, and that is something we'll probably talk about a little bit later on our agenda. Oh, so, that, so that'll be coming up a little bit later. Because yep, I know uh, Shawano communities, they're, they're talking about doing that as well. I didn't know what the heck was going on with that at all. Any chance? Okay. Um, let's move on to M1, the Bo Mettler campaign kickoff. Brad. I'll just do a quick introduction of the, the, the real guys you want to talk to. Tom Barnhart, Dave Stroud. I don't know if Patrick's going to join him or not, but... Um, <laughs> That's why he's here, right? Oh, boy. Anyway, um, um, <laughs> Thursday, May 12th, the, we're having a Bull Mettler Innovation Center capital campaign kickoff. And I'll let Tom and uh, Dave talk about that in further. Okay. Yeah, I'll make it, I'll make it quick. So um, we've been talking for a few years now about uh, adding 
a big manufacturing element, an engineering element to our to our uh, tech ed department at the at the high school, and uh, so we've really uh, pulled everything together with the help of Brad, with the help of uh, Barbara Caldos of uh, Somerville Architects, and uh, with the help of Anne Franz of the NEW Manufacturing Alliance. We've uh, basically pulled together the effort to start a capital campaign kickoff on May 12th, and um, I believe we sent out an invite to all the school board members, so, so this is what that's about. Um, yeah, awesome. So, uh, so this, what, what this event is, is going gonna, is gonna to be like is we're going to have some brief uh, speeches from uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Haynes. Uh, we're going to also have uh, uh, the president of the WTEA, Wisconsin Tech Ed Association, speaking. Uh, the director of career and technical education, Brent Kindred, is coming up to speak. And uh, also some members of our advisory board all talking a little bit about, um, you know, validating our cause and why why this type of education is so important to our community here in Ashwaubenon and why, why this uh, innovation center is just so needed. And um, then uh, the, big, the big celebration point are going to be two things. Uh, first of all, it's, it's uh, the Bull Mettler Foundation, which has been the real spark that lit the fire for this whole initiative, helping with a huge donation of a CNC machine that we installed in uh, October, which has just been terrific. Hasn't it, Pat? Mm -hmm. Yes, I actually that, got Pat. to use it once. <laughs> 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 well, barely. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, but at any rate, uh, yeah, so Pat's been a big part of that. Just in the camaraderie around it, at least. Yeah, I guess so. Um, so, uh, but yeah, so we're going to have, uh, we're going to bring some recognition and some some uh, some attention to, to just that, that effort and harness the spirit of what the foundation has done for us and try to generate some enthusiasm and other uh, possible donat donations and, and uh, people that want to partner up with us. Um, but the main event, the main showcase, we are going to have 40 students from all, all the way from the high school, from Parkview, from Valley View, all being celebrated there with their, with their projects that they've created within the tech ed. So we'll have Skills USA students, we'll have super mileage vehicles, we'll have Formula High School cars, we'll have underwater robots. We'll have uh, on-ground robots, we'll have team problem solvers, technical draft. We're going to have just this huge array of, of awesome projects with the students uh, as the showpiece in front of these projects, just talking about what did their experience this year at, at Ashwaubenon or over their years at Ashwaubenon and, and just really making, try, trying to um, just give us some validation for, or give us some, uh, I guess, for lack of a better term, uh, Relevance to, to what we what we've done um, their innovation. to show off our yeah their their ability to innovate and be young innovators, but um, yeah so we're going to have this event and we're we're, we're hoping to really ha that have that be the center of good things. We have the whole uh, NEW Manufacturing uh, Alliance, all the members in the in in the Fox Valley invited to this event amongst several other uh, uh, people, and we just love for you to come and uh, show your support and. Uh, just uh, help uh, help validate the cause. Take a look at what we got going on, and uh, and uh, join in our join in our cause, join in our effort. Um, Dave, you want to say no, that's pretty good. We got all 45 <laughs> students going to Skills. We're going. To, we're taking 45 students tomorrow morning to Madison for three days for the Skills USA State Competition, and then after that, we're going to the to Elkhart Lake for one of our big. Uh, Formula High School and Super Mileage events as well. So we've got a lot of things going on over the next two weeks, right before the event. But the cool part about that is that the students are going to be able to report out with how they did with their projects. It's kind of our, our our main event. You know, our main events are happening now, and then this will be a real good summary of what's all happened at the end of the year. So we love, the kids will just have great stories to tell. So we're looking forward to it. So please join us. And that's Thursday the. Yes, Thursday the 12th, and it starts at 3.30 and goes until 6 o'clock. And Brad, do you have, I, can we put the, do you have the link for the website on the, on the, it's on your yeah. So if you take a look on the invite, that'll sum, summarize that. And I, I encourage you, not only come, please come yourselves, but uh, bring, bring another community member. This is, this is something that we need our, our community to buy into and, and to really be a part of. So if you've got that person that's been saying, Man, you know, I've been have this shop in a Schwab and on. We've been here for 15 years. Introduce me to anybody that can run a CNC machine, and I'll hire them right now. If you know that person, bring them along because we—that's who we're looking to to say, hey, look, we're 
we're, we're trying to do something about that, and, and we're trying to do something about that in an even bigger way than we already are. So please be a part of that. So. Cool. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Well, that's what's going on. Okay. Right. Thanks, Pat. Right. Thanks. All right, um, our next discussion item is curriculum review cycle. Jill. Good evening. Curriculum work is never done. Each year there are conversations that we have regarding the standards, the materials that we use, the staff development that we're involved in. We actually want to know what we're doing and we want to know if it's working. The curriculum cycle has actually been built to balance budget costs. That's one of the things that Keith will always ask me every year, what are you adopting? And while that's really important as far as building for the budget, I think what's more important to point out that curriculum is also dependent on another, a number of other factors that happen within the district or at the state level. The biggest impact for us in our curriculum work has been working within the standards located, or standards that come from the state and come from the national level. Our curriculum cycle was, in, um, in fact, adjusted to, um, to accommodate the changes that were done within the common core standards at the state level. And then we've actually had a delay of two of our curriculum areas of science and social studies because of the delay in the approval of those standards. So with that in mind, here are some of the things that are happening within curriculum and instruction this year, coming up this summer, and then into next year as well. We are in the review cycle right now for social studies, health and phi ed, art and guidance. By far, social studies is going to be our biggest undertaking as the standards that are aligned to our current curriculum were written in 1998. The DPI is projected that new standards will be released in, a, they're guessing, about the year 2020. Now, just on a side note, um, after the Common Core standards were adopted at the state level, with the controversy that ensued, they decided to waylay adoption of standards in science and social studies. So that's been our biggest challenge, and especially so for social studies, because their curriculum was actually reviewed in about 2008, and they're in dire, dire need of new materials. So we've decided as a curriculum committee to move forward with the social studies work. We know that this, the national standards are well written, and so our work will be guided by both the national and the state standards. Health, phi ed, and art and guidance will need slight revisions. The guidance revision will include the adoption of the academic career plan, which is a state mandate, and it's required for all students grades 6 through 12, and that is to take place in the 2017 school year. And credit is due uh, to our high school and middle school guidance programs and our elementary guidance counselors, as well as our high school and middle school guidance staff. They've already started working on that academic year, at that academic career plan, and that is a big deal for our students. So hats off to them for getting that going. World language, they completed an audit, an audit last year, and the staff spent last summer, and they're spending this school year revisiting and revising the curriculum based on the audit findings. The Spanish and um, German teachers, grades 6 through 12, have recently started looking at materials. Um, and that would, again, be aligned to the work that they've done based on the audit. And I anticipate that we'll be coming to the board this summer and talking about materials for that new adoption. Science is our one of our, another one of our challenges because we've actually been waiting to write the science curriculum, curriculum for about two years. The state had announced that they were looking at the next generation science standards, and then again, with all the controversy around the Common Core, they backed off. But just like social studies, science can't wait. And so we've been actually involved in a number of staff development opportunities. We've studied the next generation um, science standards, and so we've gone ahead and, and we've started writing the curriculum for uh, new adoption. And the elementary teachers have been working very hard, and their job has been a lot easier because what we found is with the writing, the next generation science standards are very well designed, and especially so at the elementary level. It very clearly specifies what's supposed to happen at each grade level, and it's really um, innovative at how they've um, provided performance expectations, which actually, actually guide what we um, look at as far as assessment. With that said, the elementary uh, team will probably be coming to you in either May or in June with uh, their curriculum and then their recommendation for an adoption. 
So looking ahead to the next school year, we're going to begin an audit with the music department. And then we'll also be having um, the business, tech ed, and family consumer science will come into review. And as a side note, it's always exciting to work with our tech ed gentlemen. As you notice, they've got a lot of energy and a lot of enthusiasm, and they've got a lot of great ideas, and so it's hard to contain them. Sometimes the curriculum cycle is very good, especially with them, because they're always coming forward with great ideas, and so I'm looking forward to working with them this next year. Um, we'll also be continuing our work with science at the 6th, 12th grade level, because their challenge is a little bit more difficult when you look at how science is integrated and we have to look again at 6 through 12, and there's not a lot of material that's been written yet to support the next generation science standards. And we'll also be spending a lot of time next year working on the writing of our kindergarten through grade 12 social studies curriculum. So curriculum work, as I mentioned, is a continuous progress. It, if we're not writing, we're studying, we're reading, or we're applying and learning more about each curricular area. Budget purposes may be the driving force behind some of the curriculum work that we do, but really when it comes down to it, the heart of why we're in the curriculum process is to look at student work and student achievement. We're anticipating a lot of work and we always would like any extra help if you'd like to come and join us. <laughs> Do you have any questions for me as far as curriculum work? Jill, does the six-year cycle seem like the right cadence? No, us. not always. And again, it, it really depends on the ebb and flow of what's happening. When I first came into the district, the state had started working on math and English standards. And they were very well written. And we were anticipating that we could follow within the curriculum plan. Well, then they stopped writing those, and then the Common Core came in. And so when I said no so quickly, sometimes six years is too long of time. We're finding that with science, elementary is ready to roll, but the secondary. Uh, 6 through 12 is going to need that additional time. So we do kind of have that ebb and flow where we may come to you in five years or we may take six. Or in the case of social studies, we've had to back that up because there haven't been standards that we can look at. Okay. So how much do you take the material that you're reading and researching or the Common Core type materials and customize it and make it our own versus just taking it verbatim from these other sources? What we do is the standards guide the process that we use. And so we really don't have a lot of play, especially when you think about the assessments that the state offers us. In English, language, arts, and in math, the assessments are built off of the state standards. And so we can play with them a little bit, but when you know you're going to be assessed on it, you have to be careful. And again, I'm not going to say that everything that we do is keeping in mind of the state assessment, because the standards are very well written. But we're kind of, it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword, if you may, because we have the state standards there to kind of tell us what we need to do. But then we also have um, other considerations that we want to bring into play. For example, cursive handwriting is probably one of the best examples that I can give you. It's, it's not included in the Common Core, but we've included it in our work. I don't know if that answers your mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. So, so a, lot of, a lot of times you have to take the curriculum then and drive towards the standardized testing that's coming from the state? What we do, yes, is take the standards, again, that come from the state, knowing that we're going to be assessed on that, and we identify the standards that are critical and core, and that's what we build our curriculum on. And then we purchase materials that are aligned or closely aligned to that material. In some cases, we find that there's nothing really out there yet or nothing that meets our needs. So sometimes we have that waiting game until publishers catch up with the latest revisions and standards. So you said that um, basically the cur curriculum is budget driven. Sometimes, so yes. So most of it, the budget driven part is textbooks. Correct. Right? Are you seeing more and more online? The challenge, or, or what we're finding with online text, is you still have to pay about full price. Really? Yes. And you, there might be an additional $10 charge. But don't you get revisions then with that? Yes, you do. But you still have to pay, if a textbook is $79 or sometimes 120 you still pay, pay that plus a $10 additional fee to cover the electronic license. Wow. And then do you pay with the changes? Or? No, we don't pay with the changes. That's that $10 deal. But then in six years when the license is up, then we decide if we want that text, and then we have to re-up. What we're finding is that the electronic text isn't really 
meeting our needs yet. They're starting to become a lot better than just a PDF or a picture of a page. Some of the new science materials that we're looking at are more innovative where you can actually have an electronic text and click on a picture and then it'll actually take you via video maybe to a museum or it might take you to an underwater cave or in the ocean in the in the jungles. Did you also have a one-time fee for the textbooks, even electronic? Six is years. It, uh, is it, or is that good for six years? Yes. What we do is we'll pay, I'll give you an example, a science textbook will cost $110. If we add the additional $10 electronic fee license, that price is 120 and that lasts for six years. And then if we decide that we want new material, and oftentimes we do, then we would pay an, an, another textbook fee. How old is your oldest textbooks that you have out there? Right now our social studies group is working with 2008. 2008? Mm -hmm. Wow. And we've been waiting and waiting and waiting. And I give the social studies team a lot of credit because they are in dire need of material. But we really, we didn't know what to do. The standards are from 1998 and they're very, I don't want to say poorly written, but they're not very well written. And we just can't afford to wait any longer. We just feel that the national standards are, are really what we're looking at. We feel that the state will probably go that way as well. So but we can't wait. They'll be implemented then in 1718? Mm -hmm. okay. That's the plan. Are we limiting ourselves teaching the standards? Are we limiting our kids' education by doing that? Or can't we educate to a higher level than that? We can educate to a higher level, and we have lots of discussions about that. As we research and we look at the standards, we're finding that they're very well written. In fact, they're a lot more rigorous. The national standards are a lot more rigorous than the Wisconsin standards previously. And when you think about limiting our students, when we had discussions about handwriting and cursive within English language arts, it really wasn't there. But we, our teachers value handwriting and that cursive writing, so they put that into the curriculum. So they raise the standard. If we, if we feel that we can do better, we'll certainly add that in. But our conversations around the standards have been very positive. I think one way to raise a standard is the realization that you get a department of teachers around the table, and they all read the same social studies standard. It may mean something totally different to Brian and it does the Paul or Jay, that's where it takes the time of the staff to sort of unpack those and come to an understanding. This is how we're interpreting that standard in terms of just development time to embed that. And that's what we're starting to learn is across the district, like a lot of places, we're realizing there's holes there where we really need to spend time really knowing clearly in the classroom from A to B to C that there's a consistency the consistency in that focus is where you see, you know, consistent academic achievement. And I just don't want us to lose our identity, as, uh, and because if, if every everybody's teaching the same standard, they might as well box it up and give it to you and, and teach it. Then. Mm -hmm. Because why why have the individual districts doing what they're going to do? You know, if you're going to teach science, you're going to teach science to this standard. Everybody's going to teach it the same way. Should be teaching it the same way if it meets those standards. Well, and we'll, we will go about teaching it in different ways. Some teachers are going to follow a textbook. Some teachers will design a unit. We all get to that same end. But one of the biggest comments that comes out about looking at national standards or common core, whatever, is the fact that we want to make sure that our kids are at least on the same playing field. When you look at the model academic standards, they were given like a D, I want to say, back when they were evaluated by against other standards. Minnesota, Michigan, um, Massachusetts all had higher expectations and then we are sending our children out into the, the world of work and they're competing against kids that have a much more rigorous standard and they may have gone further in their education so at some point the core was developed to level that playing field and then again good discussions around the table we can make that determination of where we want to go within the curriculum or within the standard. I just don't want to limit ourselves. Like yes. <laughs> Yeah, I don't want to teach to something. Mm -hmm. I want to teach beyond it. Yeah, mm -hmm. stretch. Yeah. And we have found that in our discussions, we're actually, the standards that we're adopting are much more rigorous than the state of Wisconsin. So we're actually stretching 
And it's been exciting and great conversation. And later on in the agenda, you'll find that we're coming back to talk about additional time for teachers to actually talk more about the standards and talk about what they're instructing and that whole staff development piece. It all blends in to all the curriculum work that we do. And when we come back, you'll, we'll talk about the holes in our science curriculum when we come back and talk about elementary. That's been some really good work. And, and our program leaders and our committee, lead, our committee members do a phenomenal job. Great, good. Thank you. Thank you. OK, let's move on to um, action items. N1, alumni blast. Mark. Uh, the Alumni Association is, uh, um, as I mentioned earlier this evening, that uh, um, last year, last August, we put on the, the 50 year celebration. And we had such good positive responses from that that uh, they wanted us to see us continue on with it from the public's view. Uh, but it seemed like a, a nice uh, way for uh, classes to get together. Uh, for the reunions, uh, a good community, uh, networking time, uh, people had fun, get together. And uh, so we're continuing on with this as far as the Alumni Association in conjunction with uh, working with village staff and school district personnel. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to do is bring forward uh, a request, it's under an action item. Uh, the village of Eschwabin uh, is, is um, putting all their uh, their staff time as far as uh, putting it together all their park and rec staff and everything moving all the picnic tables in cleaning it up all that kind of stuff and last year it was right around two thousand dollars that they had had uh, budgeted for it that's what we're budgeting this year for this about the same amount of uh, uh, people that were there and I'm requesting that uh, that uh, seeing if what your thoughts are on it. Um, uh, last year we had uh, three different groups make about a little over five thousand dollars a piece, uh, from Jaguar backers, uh, alumni association, and the uh, education foundation. Uh, we're changing the structure around this year to emulate celebrate the peer, how they do things uh, as far as uh, their funding of the staffing that's there and everything but there's still the core things are still there uh, we have about ten thousand dollars in cost right off the bat and uh, I'm requesting that the school district match the village funding of two thousand dollars for this next year until we can become self-sufficient and and make this thing an annual event um, through our budgeting process you know th this year and everything and I think after this year if we have if we have the same revenues we have the same expenses as we did last year and everything we project that you know if we we're going to be making you know roughly the same amount of money and then we can be self-sufficient that the village doesn't have to pay it the school district doesn't have to pay anything but it shows that joint cooperation from the school district and the village like we have in the past and uh, working together so that's what i'm here requesting tonight uh, informing you of what is happening and uh, what we can, you know, what we, if we can financially support that as well again this year. Brad? Sounds good. <laughs> he says it's a lot of a big effort on the village has been amazing with both last year's event and this year's event. And um, it was, I think that the school district, we were a little bit more involved last year because it was the 50th anniversary of the high school. But like Mark said, it's just such a community thing, and it's a platform for all the class reunions, and it's a, an offshoot of the Alumni Association, and just like Mark said, showing that cooperation, that making a community and a, a village and a uh, school district partnership, I think that just bodes well with how we do the event. The committee's been meeting on this at least once a month uh, since last year. Um, as we get closer to the event, uh, through the summer months, we'll be meeting at least bi-weekly and then it'll go to weekly right before the event so I mean there's a lot of time that gets stuck into this by a core group of about eight to ten of us that are probably doing it um, so I mean it's we're trying to put it on as low cost as possible by by getting sponsors and that sort of thing and that's that kickoff is going to be happening in the next few days and uh, through the next month here 
Uh, so we get, uh, but we do have, I mean, it's April, or it's August 13th, starts at 2 o'clock, runs till 10 o'clock. We are going to be having bounce houses for all the kids. The lake's going to be open for free swimming for all the kids again, their families, if you will. Oh, man. We have uh, bands and DJ playing all day, Cougars and uh, Big Mouth. Um, we were all received last year. I think that uh, they're the top premier bands in the area. It's highly predictable we'll have the best tasting Optimus corn, if not in the state of Wisconsin, <laughs> but in the nation there too. So there's yep. your Optimus plug. It was really good last year. So yeah. There you go. And you know, Mark, to your point, it really is a community event. Yes. And you know, there's a, the optimists have always been friends of the you know the the school district, you know, the Jaguar backers. You know, have always been there as well. Um, I forget who the third person. Yeah. Foundation. Oh, sure. Foundation. 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 Yeah. So they all been great supporters of the uh, the school district. So yeah. just add in. So we would need to have a motion, right? Mm -hmm. If I mean, uh, any more discussion on this? My first question is to Keith, I mean, or Brian, I mean, where do we, I mean, I mean, do we take that out of the board's? Yeah, where would it come from? Budget? I think the board budget makes the most sense. Uh -huh. Keith? Yeah, that's right. Okay. I'm not going to make the motion because I'm the one that brought this forward, so I need one of. <laughs> I'll would. make the motion to approve the $2,000 for the uh, Schwabenon blast to match the village contribution and that would be a one-time thing for right now right yep. if okay. it's something that has to come back forward we would do that again but I'm hoping we don't have to wait a second I'll second can I, can I ask a question sure the two thousand dollars is that if spent or is it a two thousand dollar direct contribution to it or you know how who who's the money going to how's this all gonna work well as you the the alumni association is the one that's putting this forward, so it would be going to the alumni association. It's a donation. To put this on. So we put make a contribution to the alumni association to help fund the you know, things that are tents, mm -hmm. bands, uh, that sort of thing. It's just the, the structure of the thing. So uh, I, I guess it would be in support of the Australian uh, Blast community-wide picnic. I'm just because there's not, uh, from an audit standpoint, there's not an invoice, there's not anything detailed to back that up is where my concern is. We can give you an invoice if you'd like. Having some detail to back it up would be a good thing. Probably be helpful. Okay. All right. Any other discussion? Will it always be the same groups that will have the money at the end? No, or that's does that get determined? The key thing to this is that, uh, like, uh, anybody that any, the way we set it up is that um, any organization, nonprofit organization, that'd like to sell product there, they buy it through the alumni association. Let's just say it's um, Jaguar Backers. This year they're gonna, they are looking at selling hamburgers, hot dogs, and soda, water. Um, they give us this, they give the alumni association a, like 25 percent of whatever their gross revenues are. Okay. Optimus, good another good example. Uh, we don't we usually don't have our our um, youth groups selling beer. Optimus sell the beer. Uh, we're asking for a 50 percent contribution for uh, beer revenue. Optimus is a community group that usually gives back to the community in the first place, but we still got to cover those expenses. Whether we have 100 people at this thing and it rains all day, or we have 10,000 people there and we make lots of money, I mean, it's someplace around along the way we need, we need uh, people there, you know, to cover that expenses, and, and that's why you know, Celebrate the Pier does it as well. Um, over the years, as the event's grown at Celebrate the Pier, percentages have changed. So if um, we have a group, Freilu's, out of uh, the pier, I believe, that sells um, shaved yogurts and stuff like that, exactly. So, I mean, they would give us 25% of their revenues. If, if um, the tennis team wanted to do booyah or... Softball. They would do the same thing. Softball. I mean, they've helped us in the past before. They'd sell the booyah and make it and everything. 
but just like everybody else, they would give us a percentage of that because we're the ones setting up all the security, all the tents, all the ice, you know, products, all that kind of stuff. Okay. So. All right, we got a motion and a second. Any other questions? Okay, all in favor? Uh, aye. aye. Opposed? Well, she carries. Thank you very much. Do you have what you need, Keith? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, M2. No, I'm sorry. N2. Policy update. Second read. Brian. Okay. Like you said, it's a second read on this. I recall last month we talked about there was a question, though, that did arise and had to do with that 3217 series, 3217, 4217, had to do with um, off-duty or retired um, law enforcement officers, you know, um, being part of this policy. To make a long story short, I met with Chief Dunning, and he shared with me a, a standard that we built into the policy, but in a nutshell, they require individuals to meet a standard, and it's a, it's a they have to regularly qualify in the, to use that firearm. So that standard is now built into this policy. And he has no problem if you build that into the policy. He understands the concern, the question you had. And if you're interested in seeing the entire document he sent, I can route this around to you. But it's um, that's in a nutshell. I mean, they require them to be qualified. So you know they are certified and they're also law abiding and as we know in any profession people can be removed from that profession for a lot of reasons this kind of is a safeguard to sort of underline that they're qualified so I'm sure they have to in, in terms of shooting qualifications there's an annual qualifier there they have to keep their skills at a certain level so regardless of the age they have to qualify to be tied into this so Eric seemed two times seemed to think that this was a good way to go if you tie that into this particular policy. Okay. Mark, do you have some questions? Yeah, not on that one, though. I'm glad that you clarified no, that with that problem. Problem. Yep. So, um, I'm going to start out with 0100. Okay. Um, on the last page, uh, as far as voting, and there's several other spots in here as well. Um, I'm not 100% in favor of having voting of members if they're on the phone or Skyping. Um, I don't have a problem with members participating, participating, but I think that it should be to the people that are there. That and, and I know that there's differences of opinion on this. The village level, they feel differently on it than I do. I'm in the minority there, but I don't know how everybody else here feels on it. I feel the same way. Um, so I mean, I don't. I, I hear the way it's just fine in here that it's uh, you can vote from telephone or by skyping. And I don't. I want to throw that out there to the rest of the board and see what their opinions are. What's your reasoning for not either one of you? I just think that uh, it, you have to be there to make the vote. I, I think that at certain levels of government or in different. Uh, situations that I think that it's appropriate to have somebody there that's it's I know that technology is out there right now that you can do it but um, you could you could theoretically not be at a meeting for six months or whatever and vote every single time and not be there and is that fair to everybody else that's sitting here I don't think so I don't think you can see the environment of what's going on during that meeting either you, know, you can't get the feel of uh, you know, for something that's going to be very important, most of the time we pretty much are in agreement with it. But there is other times when yeah. discussion does happen, and you don't see and you don't feel what's going on as far as what's in the in the crowd um, or other board members. You know how they feel things. That's why I agree with Mark. I think you, you they, they can participate. They can put their you know their thoughts into it. But I think that you should be here in order to vote. Well, I, I disagree. So that's I'll be on the other that's, side. That's why I say it's, 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 there's you've, you've got the technology, 
if something comes up, if you have to be away for whatever reason it might be, um, and the technology is there, I don't see why um, you shouldn't use that technology and, and have the opportunity to represent, as you've been elected to do, represent the voters. And why would you take that away just because what, because you're not able to be there physically, whether it be due to an illness or a, uh, something that's taken you away from the community. I don't have a problem with that, Brian, I guess, if as long as there's some limitations put on it. You can only do it two meetings or whatever in a row. I mean, well, it should probably be in something like this. I, I don't disagree with that. And that's something we could change. I'll yeah. agree with that statement. You know, we should be able to, you know, embrace technology. Absolutely. You know, and be able to use it, but to your point, is is very valid. You know, it, it should not. It should be the exception, not the rule. Right. And I think you you mentioned government at a certain level. You know, this is pretty grassroots. School districts, school board is is not Congress, which some of those people but probably should be away anyway. Yeah, but they can't vote. If no, they're I know by they the can't. phone or whatever. I, I know, but you and I think you get to a certain point where it may be makes more sense but I don't think this is that level I don't think what we're doing rises to that level okay so village level it's okay to call in and county it's not state it's not that's where you think the level of I, I don't know exactly where it should be placed I, I just think embracing the technology utilizing the tools that we have there and if it's a situation um, and I'm not saying that it can be don't show up for any meetings and just vote in in Skype or something. Um, but when rare occasions or situations arise and you want to represent the people that elected you, why take that away? And I kind of think we had this topic five years ago, so we have not changed for five years this topic about not using Skype. I think it's there, and I'm on Brian's side. But I think everybody's professional on this board. We want to be here at our meetings, but if something takes you away, if it is something medical, and you have to travel out of state, and you have to travel and be gone for a couple months because of something medical, you're here to, your job here is to represent the community, and you have an option to do that through Skype, even though you can't be here in, in body. I think we should open that door up. So would you guys be in favor of, of limiting that to two months in a row? Or to, in a row? or to a situation that is discussed with uh, the board president or with the administration, depending on the gonna, situation? I think we should define that, uh, yeah, I not so leave too. it up to discretion um, as a board, because I, I just... Well, then how about no more than two in a row? If that were to be the situation, at least maybe start there. Sure. You know, we can always change it later. Just say, and I don't so. suggest that it happen. I mean, that, to my knowledge, I can't think of more than a couple of occasions in the four years or so, five years that I've been around here, that it even would have applied. But um, I know I had one. I know Barb, you had one, um, and you know, I don't know other than a policy that that would a limit would limit at that um, I don't see why it couldn't exist whatever you decide to do of course you have the prerogative to come right back as a board if you feel it's being violated and just revise the policy and I agree with you I mean I know the last five years it this does, is not, it not been an issue right. I'm not saying Barb you may raise a good point somebody develops an illness and they need to travel for an opinion or something I mean Things can happen. The thing about it is, on um, uh, on the village board, we've got an older population, and they like to go out of state for a month or so at a clip. And <coughs> we've got a little younger crowd here, but it, it, it's a totally different population there than it is. You know what I mean? It's a mm -hmm. uh, it's a different level. Yeah. Um, and I just think we have to, like, I don't, I, I'm not, and I, th I respect everybody here, but it's when you don't, you know, when something else happens and there's a next board that comes in. 
Well, I think it'd be the exception instead of the rule, but you know, why limit ourselves? You know, at this point, you know, the um, you know, a lot of times with that, you know, um, I don't know, conference calls, you know, Skype, you know, the technology is not quite there yet, where you know you can really hear what the atmosphere is. You know, within a group, there's a lot of static. You know, Skype is the same way. You know, so I don't think we the technology is quite there yet, where we can just make a blanket statement that we should go to it. But you know, I don't think we should limit ourselves here either. You know, if something comes up with medical situation like you said yeah why not well then uh, if you want to if you that's the, your philosophy on it then I want to take these one at a time because if unless there's limits on here I won't vote in favor of it yeah, we could do that. so I mean I, I I would be more than willing to vote in favor of it if there was uh, every other meeting or something like that but if you say not limit yourself then I don't have a problem with that. I'm not going to, you know, but I'm not going to support it, I guess. Sure. And we could go two, three years without it being an issue. Right. And if it does become an issue, you know, like, like Brian said, we can address it at the very next meeting. Mm hmm So, so would you have a motion that you'd want to make, or? If, you, if I can make my motion, it's not going to, they, they don't, they're not in favor of it, so. Well, I guess um, we're, well, I'm saying that, you know, we could put that two-month contingency on there you know, or not having it more than two months. Okay. I guess I would be in favor of that. And then, you know, just have the flexibility later on, like you said, to, you know, if that's being abused or if we perceive it as being abused, then we change it. Then we change it. Yeah. So go ahead. Put it, make, make, put it at two. Motion. Oh. Well, I'll make the motion then that we add... Uh, you know, not more than two months in a row. There you go. Added on to the voting section of policy 0100. Okay. We have a second on that? I'll okay. second it. Okay. Any other discussion? Jennifer, you got that? Mm -hmm. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Um, 0140. Vacancies of the school board. Yep. Uh, everything else on there is okay until you go to the second page. Um, you go to E1. I think that should be eliminated and it should be what, what it should state instead of that is it goes to the next election. Just because I, I don't think that uh, we've ever given the board president that much authority before, and it's never happened. I mean, if that would have if that would have uh, been in place in 1989, I would not have been on the school board. At Just to time. give you a little feedback, it's not uncommon, though, Mark, for boards and other school districts to do that, especially when you have a five-member board. The decision you can make by not allowing that here's the other the other side of the coin is you end up having a four-member board yep. now we don't have it's rare for us to have a split vote our history but I'm just saying you can have motions then that get tabled for example a two and two and it depends on the period of time if it could be a month and then then the position is filled but you know obviously it could be also an entire term that you would go with four people. Just just so you're mindful of of that decision if if you go there. Yeah, certainly it's gonna all be in our best interest to try to fill it within sixty days. Yeah. Have we ever had this in the past? Yes. Hmm. That's what you're saying happened in 1989. And after that as well. This happened twice since I've been on the board. I was trying to figure out your age. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I can tell you almost exactly. His age. <laughs> Is that the oldest one here? <laughs> I, 
I mean, it, it, it worked out okay, even if it was a four-member board. After that, you know, if we couldn't agree on it, um, it just, um, it, 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 and it never, um, it never, um, one time we filled the spot, and one time we didn't. Yeah. And if you would have multiple people interested, there's nothing to stop a board from interviewing and having a process before sure. you appoint. Right. That's certainly uh, right. up to the board to do that as well. So, I mean, there's a lot of ways to approach that if that happens. Because I would think the foundation of a board is that you would never have that situation where one person would be in charge of right, doing right. anything without everybody right. else's input or action. Involvement, yeah. yeah. Okay, so my motion for 0140 is to remove E1 and put in the next election, school board election, I should say. It's filled at the next, by the next school board election, or at, you will. We have a second? Second. Discussion? So, is there a certain amount of time limit on that? So let's say that, that somebody's elected and then six months later they're unable to fill a pressing position. If, if that case happens in six months from now that we, uh, somebody decides that they're going to get off the board, it's uh, December. Mm -hmm. That's perfect timing to let the village, let the, let the Have public, a special election? Let the public fill it in April because um, it's, if I would I would be in favor of letting us not even going through the motions of doing it because the advantages of uh, being appointed by the board and going into that next election they have to be elected anyways at that time because it's fil fulfilling an unfulfilled term so why why get them on why get them on board with two months and give them that much of a head start if you will over that next that, uh, other people that might the other want people that might want to. So, what would happen if it was af if the vacancy occurred after the first of the year when nominations or, or you know the ballots already established? Well, then I mean that's we hopefully then we fill it then. Then we'd have to yeah exactly we'd have to fill it whether it took because then they go until the next days. April. Right, it would take you know seventeen months or sixteen months something right. like that prior to just to election. challenge your comment marker, kind of offer another opinion or perspective. If the board would choose and have a process, interview people, and then appoint someone, you know that's always going to be short term. A couple of things happen there. The public obviously also has the opportunity to observe that person in that position, knowing they're going to be up for election. So it's a way for you as a board to certainly work with someone, but it's also a way, it's sort of an audition to the public, if you will, before that person would officially go on the ballot. So I think there's there's advantages there for you just to consider and think about versus run maybe several months with four board members. Yes, I mean it depends on the, the quality of the school board members that you're that you get that yeah, you're interviewing at that time too. So I mean mm -hmm. um, you know it, and you don't want to give a that advantage, I guess, going into that election to somebody that maybe not what the public really should have. I don't know if that means. It does. To, I think the public, you want the public to vote on who they really feel exactly. is going to do the job the best they can do the job. So proof should be in the pudding, so to speak. Mm -hmm. in my opinion is yeah. it's a challenge to follow. Okay. Anything else? No? Okay, we have a motion out there in a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Bunch of them, and it was like a just going through them now this way. And uh, the weapons policies, I think uh, Brian had a good explanation on that. If yep. we wanted to, to take those, I would be okay with that. I would make a motion that we approve policy 
3217, 30, 4217, 5772, and 7217. Is that correct? All those? Mm -hmm. Yep. Do we have a second? I'll second. No discussion? Uh, I, I have an item here. Okay. Now, the, the one thing that wasn't all that clear to me is a definition of weapon, um, which is items approved by the principal. And everything else we have the superintendent approving most things. And that was about the only area where we wanted the, the principal. What is that under? Um, it's. It's on the two word. Uh, let's see. It's on page 72, 72, 72, 17, 32, 17, page two. Not that uh, I wouldn't want it that way, but I thought you know, it might be better to be consistent. I think the idea of it was because it would be in the building, or Brian's not in the building. Oh, okay. Okay, that would make more sense. Oh, um, I'm just going down the list here, and I would like to add 3120.06 to that as well. 3106.30. Sorry, 120.06. Your motion. Is that my motion? Do I have to re second that? I'll second it. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Um, so what do we have left? 3340, grievance procedure. I believe that these are all taken care of in our contract or our. Negotiated Handbook. handbooks and stuff, and I don't think that we should even have it in policy. Remember, our handbooks are not negotiated at this point. That's fine. I don't. I, I, I want to stand by that. I guess I. I just. I, it's. It's a. It's not a policy. I would tend to agree with Mark on that. I would recommend we double check with legal on that because I think this is a policy we need to have at the board level. This was something that because came to the board like statewide. Yeah, because you're the final decision factor in the grievance. I know, but if it's in our handbooks and everything already, why do we need to double state it in policy? That might. That's subject to legal opinion, Mark. Yeah. So I would have that's what I'm saying. Like I, 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 I think like it's okay to remove it if if our attorneys say. Please okay. table that one then. Okay. Until next so meeting. Um, that would be forty three forty also, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. have not covered yeah um, policy 5111 uh, 5200 8310 and 8310 and 8330 and 8330 are you making a motion or do you have any sure else? I'll approve those I don't have any questions on those unless somebody else does so that would be 5111, 5211, 5200, 8310, and 8330. Do we have a second? I second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, that takes care of our policies. And I mean, I just, when I was reading this through and everything, I know that was part of that. And I, I mean, if it's something that our hands are going to be tied on. We can, but I still feel that it's in there. Check it out. I would okay. say the other advantage of having that in policy is Neola then is revising or reviewing the legal wording on it to make sure we're in compliance with if the law would change. And if we would remove it from policy, you lose the legal review from the law on a regular basis. Uh, by us changing it. Yeah, if yeah. we would remove it from policy. Okay, 
Um, number three, 2016-2017 calendar changes. Jill. Um, first of all, I'd like to reference a couple of documents that were sent to you via email today. There were some modifications made to the calendar and um, to actually the um, information item that you were given. Uh, back in February, we came to the board workshop and also at the board meeting, we began discussion about the possibility to add professional development days into the calendar. Um, we've received feedback from teachers um, regarding the need for additional time to collaborate, to look at student data, to look at all the curriculum, study the curriculum work that's been done, to look at student achievement, to look at instructional practice. There's a lot of things out there that we're asking teachers to do, and um, we feel that the additional time we would give teachers would be very well used and beneficial. When we came to the board originally in February, we talked about adding full days into the calendar. And we've continued discussion outside of the board meeting. We've gone back to the administrative team, and please jump in if I forget something. Um, we've talked about how we can um, move forward with this in a couple of avenues, thinking about, first of all, half days that are currently within the calendar. We have a number of half days that are built in for um, parent-teacher conferences, or in uh, one instance, um, teacher work time. And one of the things that we found in looking at the data and the principal shared that I think is the fact that on half days, a lot of times we have attendance issues where students don't come to school. So coupled that with the idea of having staff development, we thought, well, it could be a win-win if we took some staff development time in the morning in those half days, and then in the afternoon proceeded with parent-teacher conferences or their work time, we would still have good staff development time and have less impact on what happens in structure in the classroom. So the new proposal that we're sharing with you this evening would look at three additional staff development days. Four would be half days that we would seize, and then we'd add one full day in May to give us the staff development time. We could always use more, but we felt that this would be a good starting point for us to see, to see if that would be enough time for us. Originally it was five, right? Originally it was five yes. full days. Yes. So we're, we're asking, the ask is going from five to three total, and to get to the three, there's one full day that's, that is in there, but the other four days are currently half school days. I talk to the principals and I hear about a student attendance rate of 20 to 30 percent absence on those half days. I. I'm going to put my hat on as a parent, much more palatable as a parent to have that full day because you're already your schedule's already disrupted with a half day. That's my sell on it, and it would be a huge step for us to gain that staff development time. So it is a it is definitely a compromise from what we proposed two months ago from the five days, and then we have two days built in currently as we have last year. So instead of seven, we're asking for those three days, which gives us a total of five. And we intentionally avoided December or Christmas and events. There's certain months there that it wouldn't make sense to not even not even go there because there are a lot of days that were out of school in that month, obviously with Christmas break and, and so on, winter break. So in the calendar that we're, we look at here is the one with the star in it, correct? Is the half day? The star plus the half triangle or whatever? You're looking at November red. 18th. So Pardon? You're looking at November 18th, or yeah, uh, yeah, November 18th, uh, January 19th, and June 7th. June 7th. Mm -hmm. Those would be the half days. Okay. Hey, where's the fourth one? There should be a fourth one, isn't there? Doesn't say in the C3. I think an email does. The star, like the star. Looks like it's the 10th, the 8th, the 30th. Yeah, I like these. Yeah, when you start. Yeah, we have an early release date for 9th. That's what you're losing us. Oh, I see. Yeah, the 18th, that's a full suit for the elementary middle. 
So you're talking about September 30th then? September 30th. We had a half a day in the afternoon already used for data. Okay. So in the morning we would take that and make that a full day for okay. staff development. In no, in November, November 10th? Right, November 10th, half day is parent-teacher conferences, so we would make that a full day with staff development in the morning. And January 20th, there's a half a day for uh, teacher work time, it's the end of the semester, so we would take the morning for staff development. And then in March, March 8th, is parent-teacher conferences in the afternoon, okay. we would take the morning. So what would January 19th be? But that's star nine. That's a star. That's early release. Early release. Semester. Semester. Yeah, that's the semester. And if the star means on the 19th, it's a full day for grades K through 8. And there's an early release day for 9, 12. Those are already school exams. Yes. 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 Yeah. Is that the same as November 18th? No. What does November 18th start? Full day again. Early release, release for 912. You mean for 2017? Oh, so it's AMB. Early release for early Was, I should say. You want to know this would be this coming year? <coughs> I just, it, I didn't, it doesn't say in your key, you know, what the star is. I go well, it's showing down. The star is a full day. Full day for the elementary and middle. Oh, okay. And then it's an early release for 912. Okay. Any discussion on this? Thoughts? I think it's a great uh, start. I mean, uh, to put this back in, and I mean, you are. This is in regards to the eight minutes a day that we're adding. Yes, that would be the budget implication. Is based on that eight minutes. When we take those three days that we're reducing student contact time. We have to make sure that we meet the requirement by the state and the high school would fall short. So adding in that eight minutes would keep us within compliance. And that would be just at the high school, correct? That's correct. Mm -hmm. That would put the 1,440 minutes? Well, we well, exceed. It's a question, how far do you exceed when you're going to have snow days and, and delays and things like that? So this year we got pretty close at the high school because we have a testing day for ACT. We have the, the testing days in January and the testing days at the end of the year. So. We, we want, in order to have it over two days of buffer so we can have two snow days and a late start or an early release or two, we need to add that time. And then the high school day matches the middle school day. We'll be able to share busing and do some other things as well. Smart. Okay. Well, it seems like a win-win. You know, we help out the parents mm -hmm. and then we give the teachers additional time for in service. So. And it was really interesting. We've had discussions also with, with staff, and the one thing they've said is, please, when we have that learning that you bring in, whether it's a staff trainer, is please give us that work time also to reflect on what they've learned and just collaborate. And so we've listened to what the teachers have had to say, too. So we'll make sure that there's a nice balance in that. OK. Um, can we get a motion on this? So move. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. I hope they got enough stuff to do those days. <laughs> well, yeah, but what's that going to be for people my age? Because I'll be graduating next year. <laughs> <laughs> Dang, bad luck there, Patrick. <laughs> I'm all sad, like I signed a diploma for you. Oh, you're going to be announcing my name anyway. <laughs> that would be eight, eight minutes a day of more learning, right, Mr. Nelson? That's right. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to the Cormier parking lot bid. Keith, good news. Always good news. We got bids came in below our expectations for Cormier parking lot resurfacing. <coughs> I just want to be clear, we've talked a lot of different options at Cormier, and, and this is a part of our long-term plan at Cormier with the parking. This is the existing parking lot, which if you've been in it, you almost need to have a four-wheel drive because there's some big ruts where the garbage truck picks up the dumpster. There's some other issues. It's, it's old. It needed to be replaced. 
what we're able to do is grind that parking lot in place and it creates more base so it'll have more structure to it. In addition, we're expanding the parking lot to the north to add another row of parking and we're taking out an area where if you've been in front of Cormier, they put cones up to keep cars from going in in the morning. We're going to put curb on curb and sidewalk there so we don't have to put cones up every morning and we don't have to worry about cars driving in there. As I mentioned, the bids came in really well below what we had expected for this portion of the job. We recommend uh, the company is MCC Incorporated. Uh, their bid was $53,125.06. What did you have bid for, or what did you have budgeted for this? We were estimating close to 70000 or around 70000 for this. Mm -hmm. So it'll free up some additional money in the five-year or ten-year building budget. But just realize this is the good news. There's also bids that come in a little above sometimes. We, so we're not going to change that budget because this came in under the next project might come in a little over. That's just the way the construction world works. So it, it's good news because now we have $13,000 or, I'm sorry, $17,000 in that budget for the one that comes in over to help us so we don't have to rate another budget. What we'll do at the end of budget years, we've got that Fund 46 set up now, so when we have a positive variance in the maintenance budget overall, We'll put that money in Fund 46, which then will go to a future building project. Remember, that's the five-year time frame that we have to get in there, but it'll help us put some money in there. This project will happen this summer, if you approve it, uh, probably during part of summer school. I've already talked to Mrs. Arena about that, and she has plans for what they're going to do without a parking lot and how they're going to handle the summer school that happens at Cormier, which is the getting ready for 4K and getting ready for kindergarten. My understanding is that Tom split this up so he got more favorable bidding? That appears to be a way it worked. We broke the, the project down and we're breaking it down into sections and this came in really competitive. We were really impressed, especially when you look at the major referendum projects and how the bids came in there. We were I was worried we didn't have enough budgeted, but Tom worked really hard Kudos with the contractors and, and made sure he, if you set a project up right, contractors are able to bid you more competitively and this, that's the case here, I believe. Great. So, Keith, how long after this starts uh, that it's going to take? How long, oh, is it to, how long does uh, the project take? Mm -hmm. I'm going to estimate it takes a month. I'm going to push them to be less than a month, but I think we're looking They'll be at ready for school to start. Ready for school? Okay. Yeah, it will, it will, it'll be ready for school, no problem. I'm hoping it's ready long before school. Okay, thank you. Make a, make a motion to approve the bid. Second. Second. Yep. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Keith. It's good to have good news once in a while. Keith, we're coming right back at you. Okay, budget. We don't need any action on budget here. I, I just think it's important for you to see the updated budget and where we are as we get into the next couple items when we look at what's happening staffing-wise. I'll give you a quick review of the law as it, as it affects you and teachers on budget. If we do not issue a non-renewal for finance purposes or layoff to a teacher, we don't give a preliminary approval this month, then the teacher's contract will automatically renew by state law. So that's why it's so important to have this meeting here and then have another meeting by the second Monday in May. So we have to issue a preliminary notice before the end of April and before May 15th, we'd have to issue a final notice if we were going to non-renew for financial purposes or lay off a teacher. So that's what, what we're doing here is we're talking about budget just to see where it's, so you get an update on where we are because we have some partial layoffs as part of our whole budget balancing, but the picture has improved significantly from the last time we talked budget. So more good news. Enjoy it while it lasts because next budget update might not be this good, but we're, we're our open enrollment numbers are, are doing okay. They're not way beyond our expectations, but they're in the ballpark, so we're improving there. Uh, we've had some uh, really good news on our health insurance, and that has helped us tremendously uh, as far as our budget, uh, and it's allowed us to minimize the number of layoffs. We have, a couple, we have a couple partial layoffs, which will be the next item. But before we go to that, I'll ask if there are any budget questions. Where's the bottom line at now? Where is the bottom line at now? That's For prioritized budget balancing cool. items. So you need a little over six hundred thousand dollars, or we need a little over six hundred thousand dollars in budget reductions to balance the budget. Based on enrollment projections, we're showing a little under five FTE of reductions, so that gets us about three hundred and fifty thousand dollars of that. So then we have 
I'm sorry, that gets us 250,000. So we have about 350,000 of budget reductions. But I look at the first three items you see on the prioritized list. Those are things we would do regardless because they just make sense. The energy savings by doing LED retrogrades in, in, in fixtures. Um, we reduced our utility budget by by locking in rates on our on utilities on gas, so that saves us money. Technology E-rate money, we, we were approved on E-rate rebates on some of the technology equipment. We would, there's no reason not to do those things. But we're able to go through and where we're looking is, we're in item number four, the 10-year maintenance plan, where we were planning on delaying items. We're able to bring a lot of those items back into the budget. And even with the items that were contributing to the referendum project, we're able to do a, the majority of our maintenance plan and we will monitor that as the year goes on if we get more open enrollment students. If something else improves our budget, we're able to add those projects back in. So we'll, we're, I'm hopeful we'll get there. We haven't reduced the tech. This allows us not to reduce the technology budget. It allows us not to make a lot of those changes that we had talked about earlier. So it's, it's a much better picture than we had just a month ago. When would you anticipate that second phase at Cormier being done then? Well, that's a good question. It's something we can talk about. Um, we have, that phase is going to be the much more expensive phase. Mm -hmm. So what we, what I would recommend is we would look at doing that the following summer because it's a two-part process. One, we have to create a door on the north end of the building so there's some in, indoor construction and some work there. There was a door there years ago. We'd have to recreate and recreate the hallway. Two, we'd have to create the parking lot drive in and drop-off area for parent drive-up drop-offs. And that's a fair amount of blacktop that we'd have to create and we'd have to work through the process there. So it, in order to plan this and get pricing similar to what we got in this first stage, I think it would be one of those things that we would want to be bidding out in winter, this coming winter, for the following summer, and then split the budget half this year, half next year, which is how we had a plan this summer. So we would put the put money back into our tech our maintenance budget and be able to pay for half the project out of the sixteen seventeen budget and then the other half out of the seventeen eighteen budget do it over the summer. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we ever got it, Keith, but is there any way that on the next agenda we could put a Cormier site plan together for us so we could see what that is? See the whole I, plan? Yeah, I don't know if I've ever site. saw it. We saw it a year yeah, or two ago. It's been a while. while. Just, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a work in progress. And, and the other thing I didn't mention is the third part of that process is a village part where We've worked with the village, and the next time they rebuild Cormier Road, they're going to create a bump in for the bus drop-off area. It works now. Is it optimal? If you ask Chief Dunning, no, it's not, but it's workable, and, and the village has been great to work with on this. They understand the need. It's just a matter of if they're going to rebuild the street anyway, the costs are much less than if we have them tear up a street that's recently rebuilt. So it is a three-step process, and that third step is years in the future. It's happening though soon, isn't it? Well, I Broadway. don't. Know. When no. was Broad Broadway rebuilt? Cormier. No, we're talking about Broadway. We're talking Broadway. Yeah, you said Cormier. Cormier. I'm sorry. Wait, yeah. By Cormier School. It's on Broadway. I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, that's I thought, yeah. I thought that's in this yeah. year. No, it's the Cormier Broadway side of the school. Yeah, so I, I just can, want to refresh myself with that because it's been a while since we've saw mm -hmm. it. So do you yeah, want? I can a while. email it out to you guys. You can all no, see it, us, or we can have it on agenda. Okay. I mean, it's yeah. We'll be here in two weeks anyway. Yeah. Need something for that agenda, probably. All right. Um, so, any other questions on budget? No. So, we'll go to six and partial layoffs. So, partial layoffs. And more good news we've been able, as an administrative team, we do everything we can to avoid layoffs. We know how much it affects people's lives. It's, it's, it's one of the, you know, the way you keep good staff is that you don't do these things, but we know it, it's going to be unavoidable at, at times. But the good news is the fourth layoff on the list, I'm going to ask you to pull. We have found a way to keep her and actually recall her on some of the partial layoffs she had last year by reshuffling things and, and changing how we allocate the careers class at Parkview. We were able to, to recall Patty Christensen, and we're assuming you approve all this, we'll go forward and issue her the partial recall instead of a partial layoff. So what I'm proposing is we have three partial layoffs Mitch Rotier at the high school would be reduced 0.75 FTE, so three quarters of his time we would reduce. Kathy Brusky at the high school would be reduced 0.42. And Rachel O'Brien, who's an ELL teacher at Pioneer, would be reduced 0.25 or a quarter FTE. But that is her whole 
contract. So for her, it's a full layoff. The full it's a partial FTE layoff for us. So those are the three that we're looking at. Do those teachers, if they're they're teaching, have options to also um, fill in? You know, as far as like uh, sub, sub, sub. Yes, absolutely. But the likelihood of keeping someone that you've just eliminated seventy five percent of their position. But, but we do have some some in the, in the fourth person that we pulled off the layoff list. That's what she did this year. She subbed when her schedule allowed it because her time at the elementaries is much more one day, two day, three day, four day, five day, it changes. But the high school, the the time would be more possible to do some subbing. So do they get sub rate for that then? Yes. Or okay. And then again, this is not etched in stone that these people wouldn't be coming back. We can always recall later. We just, if we don't issue the preliminary layoff before the end of the month, they're back at their same contract. And these are strictly uh, enrollment driven? Yes. Right. And again, so we'll favorable up on enrollment. Two. Could change things. Could change. I, I don't want to be optimistic. I mean, we're not right. going to be adding a 0.75 teacher at the high school in one subject area based on open enrollment. That would take a tremendous amount of open enrollment. But some of that, like the high school adjustment is part of the middle school, and we're shifting a middle school teacher part-time up to the high school suite. Try to keep as many people whole as we can and look at either low seniority or low performer. This is, these are all seniority based, so I, don't, I want to be clear on that. None of these have anything to do with these teachers' performances. They weren't selected for that reason. All things equal, we fall back onto seniority, and that's where these three were selected. I would just also add those two high school positions. When they were originally hired, they weren't full-time positions. Mm -hmm. So those positions have fluctuated up and up and down. So um, both of these people were not hired initially with full-time contracts when they were initially hired. So it's kind of the so nature of the beast. There. They've been positions in flux that have gone up and down. So there are times when we don't reduce FTE where we have that at the high school because there's more course requests in one subject area than another from year to year it changes so it's part of the high school staffing life unfortunately okay so Keith how are these uh, individuals notified the the principals have all talked to them and let them know and they've been notified you know, they, we we've difficult conversations always happen face to face so we always make sure we're talking to them and that they hear it directly from their principal and they know what's happening with it so they're all they're aware of it All right, um, we need a motion for this, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. I'll make a motion to accept the list of partial layoffs. Preliminary notification. I don't know if it says that on there. Oh, is that what it says yep. on the top here? We have a second? I'll second it. Any other discussion? Just make you aware that then the May meeting, I expect we'll have these three then for final layoffs. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. <coughs> and our last action item. Um, Keith, are you handling this? I am handling this also. Extended contracts. So if these are staff members where we have needs outside the school year. And as we've worked with the board, we'll ask what is it, Mark, 15 years on this where we've played around. we've tried to reach a balance between trade-off days and paying extra for days. And some positions, for example, the counselors at the high school, we have students we need to schedule over the summer. We need them in to work on those things. So we, we strike a balance and it's half trade-off days and half extra days that they're paid. So I, I think this is as tight a list as, as we can get while still serving our students. The cost, as you can see, isn't Huge. I don't want to say it's nothing, but it, it's it's we're a little over ten thousand dollars, and I think this is a good place to be on these extended contracts. Very similar number of days, or identical number of days, to what was approved for this school. Okay. We get a motion for this. I'll mo make a motion. We approve the extended contract request as presented. Second. Second. Good second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 
opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Good night tonight. <laughs> Board of Superintendent Communications. I have nothing further. Nothing? Okay, future meetings. Um, my next board meeting will be scheduled for Monday, May 9th, 6.30 at the district office. Uh, we need an adjournment to executive session. Roll call. I'll make a motion to adjourn the executive session. Second. Okay. All in favor? No. Uh, roll call, no. Uh, no. No roll call. call. Thank you. Bandy Creek, aye. Elrod, aye. Tronson, aye. Ben Lamb and I. Lamb and I. Okay, thank you. We adjourned at 8.36. Thanks for that update there, Patrick. You guys Jennifer?